American Human Humanist Association is promoting Darwin Day resolutions. Monday is Darwin Day. And uh, there are resolutions in both the House and Senate. In the House, it's resolution H Resolution 699, and in the Senate, it's Senate Resolution 374, uh, the work of uh, Congressman Jim Hines and Senator Richard Blumenthal, respectively. And these resolutions uh, say that evolution provides humanity with a logical and intellectually compelling explanation for the diversity of life on Earth and that the advancement of science must be protected from those unconcerned with the adverse impacts of global warming and climate change, and that the teaching of creationism in some public schools compromises the scientific and academic integrity of the United States education systems. So if you want to sign the, uh, the petition or ask your representative or senator to co-sponsor the Darwin Day resolutions, uh, you can go over to uh, what is this, humanist.org, I think? Let's see. Oh, this is weird. On their entire email, they don't have their own website. Well, Google American Humanist Association or DuckDuckGo it and uh, it'll track, you'll track it down. And uh, broadband, community broadband. We're trying to make community broadband happen here in Portland, Oregon. We'll have a guest on about that at the top of the next hour. So just an FYI. John in Vernon Hills, Illinois. Hey, John, it's Anything Goes Friday. What's on your mind? Well, Tom, my question is about the possible prosecution of the entire Republican Party. I actually call them the Refugly Cons because I think the RICO Act is, was originally against organized crime, targeted mostly at the mob. Yes. And the, the, that party seems to be acting in a criminal way as a group. I was wondering if that can be done and who has to do it? I believe that the RICO Act requires federal prosecution, but I could be wrong on that. It may be that state prosecutors can bring RICO Act charges. The RICO Act, R-I-C-O, stands for Racketeering Influenced Corrupt Organizations. And yeah. it, you're right, it's a law that was passed, as I recall, back in the 60s. Uh, when we started learning about the Mafia, J. Edgar Hoover had been hiding the, even the exist and denying even the existence of the Mafia right up until the Kennedy presidency. And uh, right. in fact, when the first, the, the year before, the last year of the Eisenhower-Nixon administration, there were 17 prosecutions of organized crime in the United States. And by the end of the first year of the Kennedy administration, under the aggressive actions of Attorney General Bobby Kennedy, there were over 700 prosecutions of organized crime which is, of course, why the mob decided that they had to take out Jack, which they did. And, and right after that, the prosecutions of the mob started dropping again precipitously under Lyndon Johnson. But it, it never went back to where it was, because by that point in time, J. Edgar Hoover, who had been being blackmailed by Santos Traficante for decades about being gay, his whole relationship with Clyde Toys, Tolson and everything else, J. Edgar Hoover <laughs> could just no longer claim that there was no such thing as the mob. So when the RICO Act was passed, it was very tightly targeted, not just at the mob in general, but at the Italian mob specifically, the mafia. And um, uh, some parts of the language of the RICO Act make it um, far more difficult to deal with an above-ground organization like the Republican Party, because it was really designed to work against a, a, an organization whose existence is, is, if not denied, at least largely invisible. And so, you know, large chunks of it are useful for that kind of thing. What the Republican Party is doing, they're doing mostly out in the open. But I, I don't disagree with you, John, and I, or I do agree with you uh, with those qualifications, which is why I said I don't disagree, um, and, you know, qualified agreement. And I've said for many years, I think that the RICO Act, uh, A, needs to be updated so that it can be used against things like the big banks that conspire with drug money uh, laundering and, and uh, terrorist money laundering. Uh, HSBC got nailed for that. Other big banks in the United States have been prosecuted for that. Wells Fargo was just recently prosecuted for, you know, major fraud. Of course, nobody went to jail. No bankster, you know, has gone to jail uh, in, geez, decades, uh, or at least a decade. And, uh, you know, we need an updated RICO Act, and we need one that would be uh, broad enough to cover uh, crimes by banksters, crimes by big corporations, you know, trying to conceal how their pesticides kill people or kill bees. Uh, that their drugs are killing people, you know, I mean, there's just, there's so much corporate crime and fraud going on, and so much of it uh, should fall under the RICO Act and doesn't, 
Uh, and the RICO Act, you know, provides for, you know, radically larger penalties and damages and imprisonment uh, terms if you're prosecuted as basically organized crime. So, um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, done, I'm totally up with it. That's, that's fine. John, thank you for the call. A great suggestion. Maggie in Wisconsin Rapids, Wisconsin. Hey, Maggie, what's up? It's Margie. Oh, Margie, hey, I'm sorry. Um, I'm wearing contacts okay. today. It's a little harder to read. <laughs> um, you'll recall that then-Governor Mike Pence sold the Indiana Toll Road to a group of foreign investors. Right, principally from Australia went, and Spain, yes. Yeah, that eventually they went bankrupt, and uh, I'm not even sure who owns it right now. Well, today there is a major winter storm in Indiana, Illinois. The toll road, which of course is owned by foreign investors, is completely snow covered. Parts of it are shut down and are being detoured to the interstate highway, which lo and behold has at least two of three lanes completely clear right. and is moving and running. Our public infrastructure does not belong in the hands of foreign investors or any private for-profit entity. Amen, Selah. Yes. <laughs> you, you, you nailed it, Margie, and that's a, that is a great example. That is an absolutely great example. I did not know that that was the case, but it makes perfect sense. I mean, if you own a toll road and you're running it for profit and you get a snowstorm and you know in a day or two it's probably going to melt, then why bother shoveling it, you know? Why spend all that money? Whereas if you're a government and your obligation is to the public welfare, the general welfare, and, and therefore, you know, you need to make sure that people are safe and that they can get to work and things like that, then you, you plow the roads no matter what. And, uh, right. you know, what a classic example. Margie, thank you. I mean, the state, Go ahead. Thank you, Tom. The states are, I mean, are doing what is called conga lines, which is they take a bunch of snow plows, uh, they stagger them one across, one after the other across the lanes, and they do the entire highway yeah. at once. Oh, yeah, I grew up you in Michigan. I mean, they've been that. doing that forever. Yeah, they, you will never see that on a private for profit road. Right, because they want just one driver to deal with the whole thing and, you know, <laughs> cut it to the bone, cut yeah. it to the bone. That's the mandate of the for profit everything, basically. And, you know, because you got to jack up the profits. The CEO, who is the, co you know, of the company that owns the Indiana Toll Road, has to make his multi-million dollar salary, and his senior executives have to make their million dollar salaries, and the stockholders have to have their dividends. And all that means that, uh, hey, you know, a little snow, tough luck, Charlie. Margie, thanks yep. you. thank you for the call. Very well said, and thanks for listening to Sirius XM. Uh, XM. David in Columbus, Ohio, listening on WGRN. Hey, David, what's up? Hi. I have an uh, ongoing battle with the Republicans because they never mention cutting the defense budget in any of the literature they give me for fundraising. It's all about uh, DACA and other things, which or, are important. But this is what's killing the domestic budget. It kills it. It just, they take all of our money, give it to defense contractors, then there's nothing left. And then they scream, oh, there's a horrible deficit. So we need to find out. There used to be a, a program called America's Defense Monitor, which analyzed all these projects in, in an objective way and uh, gave us a good understanding of what our money was being spent for. We don't have that on any level. We don't have that from the Democrats. And I would call for either you or somebody to bring back that kind of analysis. Um, and it's detailed and it takes a long time, but I think um, – even a, a cursory examination of certain projects would be worthwhile. You know, in many of the European countries, I know uh, I'm for sure it's in Norway. Michael Moore talked about it in his movie, Where to Invade Next. Or I believe it was Norway. It might have been Sweden. Anyhow, it was one of the Scandinavian countries. Uh, but in, in, it's not confined to just one country. When you get your tax statement at the end of the year, A, not only has their equivalent of the IRS already calculated your taxes, so you don't have to hire anybody, and you don't have to do any math unless you want to challenge the government's assertion of what you owe. And, but number, so you simply sign the form and mail it back. But number two, and perhaps more interestingly, they break out the top 15 or 20 categories of where your money went. So they'll say, you paid this year $1,322 in federal taxes. Of that, 
$516 went to defense, although if it was Norway, it'd be more like $90 went to defense. Uh, but here in the United States, it would be, you know, well, actually, it would be more than half. It would be, you know, $750 went to defense, uh, $35 went to pay for, for uh, people in need, uh, you know, $110 went to support uh, roads, bridges, whatever, you know, and $90 went for education. They just basically break it out so you know where your tax dollars went. Right. And uh, the, the billionaires who control the Republican Party do not want to make taxes easy because they hate taxes. They don't want to be paying taxes. And so they want, they want there to be a taxpayer revolt. In fact, they've funded for years organizations that have, you know, the phrase taxpayer revolt either in their name or as part of their mission statement. And, and, you know, they want to make it confusing. They want to make it difficult. Uh, they don't want you to have a good experience with the IRS. And uh, I, I don't think it should just be the Democrats doing this. I think that I, I would love to see legislation that requires the IRS, because it wouldn't be particularly difficult or expensive. I mean, once they've got the formula, once they know what the percentages of everything are, then their computers would simply apply that to whatever you pay in taxes. So whether you paid $1,270 or $5,916, you know, the percentages are going to be the same. So it'd be super easy to calculate the numbers and tell everybody exactly what they spent on everything. And I think that would cause people to start paying attention to things like these budgets. David, thank you.